But this song uh, should get us ready for it just a little bit. Albert and Carla Elliott would like for you all to know. Well, it's not Carla Elliott anymore. It's Carla Herod. That went back a few years. They'd like for you to know how much they appreciate, how much uh, it meant to them for you to pray for them, uh, to support them, to bring food for uh, the dinner uh, just, a, just a little over a week ago uh, whenever we celebrated Doris's homecoming. So uh, we want you all to know that they deeply appreciate that and thank you so much. As it happens often, you all just are wonderful in coming through during those times. Turn to Psalm 63. It is called a Psalm of David. It is said that David composed this while he was running for his life, running from King Saul. He was a fugitive, the object of Saul's hatred and jealousy. O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary. To see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises and joyful lips. When I remember you, on my bed I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. What beautiful words. On one occasion, the disciples of Jesus came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. I am told it was not uncommon for disciples of a particular rabbi to ask that rabbi, teach me this or teach me that or reveal this to me. But when the disciples of Jesus came to him with that request, it was because they had watched him pray. And he prayed unlike anyone else prayed. Teach me to pray. Suppose somebody come to you with that very same request. Not one of your children, not one of your grandchildren, but a co-worker or an acquaintance or a neighbor came to you and said, you know what, teach me to pray. And, and what is the proper way to pray? How should I even start my prayer? You know, I believe there's a way to answer that question. And I think you can do it with the authority of Scripture. I think it would be very good for you to say this. You know what? It is never wrong to approach God in praise. To begin our prayers with praise and thanksgiving to our God. You can be sure whenever you approach Jehovah with sincere, heartfelt praise and sincere thanksgiving that we please Him. Now that's not to say that it needs to be mechanical and it just needs to be almost like a law that we approach God that way. As a matter of fact, as I was reading the Psalms this past week, it occurred to me that the psalmist would approach God sometimes with praise, many times with praise, but sometimes with petition, begging God for something. For example, the psalmist would cry out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Now that's a petition. 
have mercy on me. Or he might say, oh God, save me. And you, I, I, I call out in your name, or, oh God, hear my prayers, or, oh God, hear my cries, listen to my prayers. All of these are examples of petitions. We're begging God to do something that only He can do. So when Jesus was asked that question by His disciples, teach us to pray comes as no surprise to me that when Jesus turned to them and said, all right, this is how you pray. Remember how he started it? Our Father. Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus, when he was praying in agony before he went to the cross, cried out, Abba, Father. Abba is a, a term that was so sacred and important that the biblical translators didn't even translate it into Greek. They left it in the Aramaic form. It was so special, so important to them. And the reason was the word Abba is a way to call out to God that is very much like a child calling out to its father. As a matter of fact, the word Abba could be translated maybe into our understanding of language more like Daddy. Imagine, imagine Jesus in the garden praying to his father and saying, Daddy, save me. If it's possible, allow this to pass from me. We all look at, at Gethsemane, but I can't imagine the scene in heaven as the Son of God was crying to His Father, Father, Daddy, save me. Can you imagine the emotion among the angels? Can you imagine the passion in the Father's heart as His Son said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So whenever Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father, it was a new way of praying. Go back in the Old Testament, look it through. You won't find that any of the old prophets or any of the priests or any of the biblical writers crying out to God, Father. No, 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 no. God was too far away. He was too far removed. It took sacrifices and loud songs and glanging cymbals. But whenever Jesus prayed, it was, Our Father. And then he would say something else. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. Literally, that means, Father, may your name be honored. I heard someone who claimed to be a comedian trying to be funny, blaspheming the name of God. I got sick of it real quick. But he was saying, you know, I don't know if there's a God or not. I really don't know. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. But if there is, well, he's our father. Well, what happened to our mother? What did he do with our mother? And he just went on babbling blaspheming the name of God. By the way, just so you'll know, the, uh, the director of the movie Noah is an avowed atheist. And the company behind it, Paramount Pictures, is the same one that produced The Wolf of Wall Street. So before you spend your money on it, might better think about that. Because in the Wolf of Wall Street, I am told, I won't watch that thing, but in the Wolf of Wall Street, it has been commonly reported that God's name is absolutely trashed. But let me tell you what. Whenever this world folds up in a heap, the name of God will be glorified for it. 
The old Presbyterian teaching went something like this. The chief end of a man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It is through praise that the believer comes into, to experience God and enjoy Him. That's what the old Presbyterian said. We are told that God, in Psalms chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned, that is, who inhabit upon the praises of Israel. And you are fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. It is from this scripture that we often hear the phrase, God inhabits the praise of His people. Want to know where God lives? Want to know where God is in the life of His church? He is wherever His people are praising Him. I think we can easily agree with our Presbyterian friends. After all, with them, we sing the doxology, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all people here below. Praise Him, all you heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. That's a great song. It's a great song. It's meaningful. It's important. It's special. You see, folks, I think to live with an attitude of gratitude should be easy for us. But you know, sometimes... It's really difficult, and because of that, gratitude to God needs to be nourished. It needs to be encouraged in our lives. Why? Because we live in a cynical, sarcastic, irreverent culture. That's why. We are children who are hard to please, and we are ever demanding more. It's not what... God has done for us in the past is what God has done for us lately that we kind of look at. I read this week, you know, if you forget what God has done in your life, you will very, very quickly forget God. So if you really want to have reason to praise God today, think about what God has done in your life. Over and over and over and over again. Also, we become so accustomed to criticism. It becomes so easy for us. We, after all, we are quick to criticize our elected or appointed leaders. And quite frankly, some of them deserve it. We tend to become angry and frustrated at powerful institutions in our life and powerful people in our life over which we feel we have little control. Uh, the gas prices for our car goes up, and what do we do? What do we do? We complain about it, don't we? Food prices go up, and what do we do? We complain about it. The electric bill climbs, and what do we do? We complain about it. We feel resentment. We feel out of control. We criticize. In the Old Testament, that kind of criticism was known as something they called murmuring. Murmuring. And while the children of Israel would blame and murmur against God or, or against Moses or against Aaron every once in a while, they would also murmur against God. Because you see, listen, really hard to blame, it's really hard to praise God and at the same time blame Him for everything that goes wrong. But if your concept of God is a God who micromanages everything that happens, that has complete control and sovereign control over every decision you make in your life, that preordains everything to happen, it's kind of hard to explain what happens to a little girl in Springfield that gets raped and murdered. And it's kind of hard to explain what happens when a jet falls off the radar. It's hard to explain while innocent civilians are, are killed in faraway places and why cars are hijacked 
and while earthquakes happen and they fall on churches and, and people's lives and their homes and businesses are destroyed. If, if, if we want to blame God for every bad thing that happens in our life, it's kind of hard to do that and at the same time praise Him. But that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to ignore every good thing God has done for us and to blame Him for every bad thing that happens in our lives. But oh, how our attitude could change and how our spirits could be lifted if only we from our hearts could begin to praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered and bled and died. He is our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus the crucified. I believe that's good stuff to praise God. Really, what is praise after all? Well, first of all, by definition, praise is vocal adoration to God. You can worship God internally. Do you know what I mean? Just from your heart, in your mind, sitting very quietly. You can be still and know that He is God. And you can worship Him from your heart. But you cannot praise Him silently. By definition, praise is vocal adoration of God. That's why our songs, that's why I led you in that song. Because you know what we were doing during that song? We were praising God. We were just praising God for being good to us. And that's something we need to do from our hearts. And it's something we need to foster. And as I said, it's something we need to kind of nourish in our souls. E.M. Bounds talked about prayer as it has to do with praise. And he said, prayer is the contact of a human soul with God. It's when a human soul touches God, and it's when God touches a human soul. And that contact occurs during times of sincere prayer. So what better way to enter into His presence and really have contact with Him than with this time of praise whenever it's on our lips and thanksgiving is in our hearts. Harold Lindell said, Since adoration brings man into intimate and direct contact with God, in the role of a servant to a master, or the created to the Creator, it is fundamental to all other kinds of prayer. Now going back to that question, how should I begin my prayer? I think it's good to answer, well, you know what? It is really good to begin our prayers with praise. That is what our prayer life should be built on. It should be built on praise. It should be of first importance in our lives. David put it so well, because, of your, stead because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips shall praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Remember the context of all of this. David was running for his life. He was unjustly persecuted by King Saul. He had a group of people out with him. There were times he said apparently he got so sick he thought he was going to die. There were times he was so thirsty that he just begged for a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. There were some men who risked their lives to give him that drink. He didn't know when Saul was going to catch up with him. There was two or three times he could have killed Saul but wouldn't do it. And it was during that time he said, I will praise you God at all times. Because your steadfast love is better than life to me. Now that's an attitude of gratitude. Now aside from praise, there can be another component to our prayers. That's really important. As a matter of fact, some have taught that maybe even more important than praise is confession of sin. And the argument goes something like this. Well, you know what? If we have persistent sin in our life, unconfessed sin, it will render our prayers ineffective. Well, let me say this. Oh, how we need to be quick to confess and repent. How we need to be quick to, to admit to God, to agree with God, that whatever He calls sin is sin. Sin. 
We have become so individualistic in our culture. In one of the old Star Trek movies, Spock said that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Remember that line? Well, in our culture today, that has been reversed. The needs of me outweigh the needs of all of you. I am the most important person in my life. What I need is more important than what you need. What I want is more important than you want. As a matter of fact, if everyone in my culture, if everyone in my community disagrees with me, I am the most important person if a decision is to be made about what is permissible and what isn't. That's kind of the attitude. A man by the name of Paul Bellheimer said, Here is one of the great values of praise. It decentralizes self. When we praise God, we adjust our relationship. We are no longer the center of our universe. God is. He went on to say, One cannot praise God from our heart and remain preoccupied with self at the same time. He said, praise produces forgetfulness of self. Folks, we need a lot of praise if that's the case. We need to spend a lot of time praising God if that's the case. The, the Psalms are just filled with examples of it. In Psalms chapter 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. What a great scripture. Psalms 48, verse 1 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain. Psalms 92, verses 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness at night. That's the kind of attitude that will bring us into the very presence of our God. And oh yes, David went on to say, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Let me repeat this. You can worship God internally. You can worship God silently. You can worship God in your closet. But you can't praise Him silently. That's why it's so important. Listen to me, folks. If the choir is up here singing and Denny is up here leading you, don't sit back there with your mouth shut. Sing. I don't care if you sing bad. Sing. I can't hear you up here anyhow. But we need to sing. You know why? Because during our worship time, that is one of the times whenever we can really vocalize our praise to God. We can express something about what God has done for us. We can express our faith in Him. We can express our trust in Him. We can express our hope of life eternal, of heaven. That is the one time during the worship service that you can literally say out loud, God, I love you. God, you have been good to me. So whenever we're singing, you need to sing as well because all of us needs to praise God. And you can't do that silently. I believe this is good stuff. This morning we have the high, holy honor of lifting up our God to a lost world. And dear friends, there's nothing that God likes any more than when we brag on His Son. When we brag on Jesus. That pleases Him. That pleases Him so much. When we honor Jesus, when we honor His Father, He also honors what we do. And our lampstand will burn brightly. Notice what Isaiah said about Jesus. He's a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. He's so faithful. As a matter of fact, He's so faithful that David said, My 
soul thirsts for you. I need you in my life. You satisfy my soul. Maybe you've been looking through life and saying, you know what, my life just stinks. My life just stinks. Things haven't been going well at all. Let me say this to you. The poorest among us is richer, vastly richer, than billions of the richest people around the world. We have more food to eat, better clothes to wear, better medical attention, cleaner water. We have dentists that will care for us if our tooth is hurting. We have people who will help us whenever we have problems with our home or problems with our car. We have transportation unlike anything that's ever been known. But let me tell you, all of those material things aside, let me tell you what else we have. You and I have been blessed with the gospel throughout our lives. Something that millions of people, billions of people around the world never hear. And we have the freedom this morning to join together in this worship service and to worship our God without being molested or harmed by anyone. God is so good. He's so good to us. Why wouldn't you give your life to worshiping Him? Why wouldn't you give your praise to Him forever? Of course we would. As we ask for a song, as we have a time now when we really think about what has God done for you this past week?